Right. Why, why don't I get us going? We're pretty much on time. So good evening and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Finn Pilbro, and I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to this centenary talk being hosted and organised by Brickcourt Chambers. We are extremely lucky, honoured and excited to be joined this evening by Professor Richard Suskind, OBE, who is going to talk to us about the future of the bar. And on top of that treat, we have assembled a panel of interesting and exciting people who will share their thoughts, views and responses to Richard's talk with us. But just before I introduce them, I want to briefly to say something about Brick Court's centenary. We are very proud to be celebrating 100 years since what is now called Brick Court Chambers was founded by William Jowett. And we are looking to celebrate that anniversary in a number of different ways. Some are more outward facing, a talk like this, a talk on the future of the constitution later in the year, a talk we're doing jointly with uh, the Sutton Trust and Inter University, some of our charity partners, and I'll come back to them in a little bit. Uh, a, a podcast series that we're recording, you'll find the links to that on our website uh, and, and on most major podcast platforms. Uh, so I invite you to go and listen to them. There's some great programs out there already. And um, I have the pleasure of recording one with Sydney Kentridge and Jonathan Sumption in two weeks time. So I invite you to go and listen to those. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be waiting for the history of Brickcourt Chambers that's been penned by Charles Hollander QC that's coming out at the end of this month. Uh, so there are lots of nice outward facing things. Some are a bit more inward facing just for us. Uh, so the Brickcourt Chambers Summer Fate, which I very much hope we'll be able to go ahead, COVID permitting. Uh, there's some things we're doing just for us. But, but at the heart of everything we're doing this year uh, it is what we have called our centenary challenge. Uh, and that is a commitment on our part to seek to raise a quarter of a million pounds for our centenary charities. We have four charities uh, and 80% of what we raise is going to to two, to social mobility charities, to the Sutton Trust and to Inter University. And then 20%, recognising our, our legal roots, is going to the Access to Justice Foundation and advocate. And this event is free to attend and we are delighted that you have chosen to join us. But the invitation did also encourage you, if you wished, to make a donation to our centenary charities. And the link to the webpage will be put in the chat and it will come around in the sort of automated email that comes at the end of the talk, uh, just thanking you for attending. Uh, so I, I would invite you, if you wish, of course, only if you wish, to think about making a donation to the Sutton Trust, Inter University, Advocate, and the Access to Justice Foundation, our four centenary charities. So tonight, uh, uh, Richard Suskin will be well known uh, to most of you already, I'm quite sure. As he was saying to me just earlier, back in the 1980s, he was already doing a doctorate on AI in the law, well ahead of the curve that is coming around and catching all of us now. And, and since then, through the 90s and 2000s, he has written books such as The Future of Law, Transforming the Law, The End of Lawyers, Tomorrow's Lawyers, The Future of the Professions with his son, Daniel, and most recently, Online Courts and the Future of Justice, a, a revised paperback edition of which is coming out shortly. Uh, and he has been, amongst many other roles, the IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice since the 1990s, chair of the Online Dispute Resolution Group of the Civil Justice Council, president of the Society for Computers and the Law, and chair of the advisory board of the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, so we are extremely grateful for Richard for agreeing to give his talk this evening. Uh, and Richard will talk for uh, about 45 minutes. And after that, I will invite comments, observations, questions from our assembled panel. So we have uh, Sir Nicholas Green, Lord Justice of Appeal and Chair of the Law Commission. We have Alex Chalk, MP, the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Justice, currently Prisons Minister, but also Criminal Barrister from Six Kings Bench Walk. Uh, we have Krista Band, Litigation Partner at Linklaters, and before that, Herbert Smith. And we have Supervisor, uh, Barrister, member of Brick Court Chambers, but uh, uh, until recently, managing partner of Quinn Emanuel in London, founding manager partner of QE here in London. So we've got a range of voices with a range of perspectives, and they will listen to what Richard has to say to us uh, and offer their observations, their thoughts, their questions, which hopefully will provoke a little bit of a debate and provide something of a substitute 
for that interaction that we might be able to have if we were all real together in one place. So thank you all very much for attending. Uh, Richard, over to you. Well, thank you, Finn, and thank you, Brick Court, and congratulations to Brick Court on your centenary. And you must be rightly proud of the, the great set you've created. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about the future of the bar. I should start immediately by pointing out that punctuation is very important to lawyers. And so that my 2008 book title was the end of lawyers question mark and not as Finn suggested the end of lawyers nothing. Uh, if it hadn't been the end of lawyers question mark, it would probably have been the end of my career exclamation mark. Uh, I was wondering what the future might be for lawyers in the world of technology. And that's what I want to wonder again today. I want to speak, yes, about the future in relation to technology, and my emphasis is going to be in civil cases. And how I thought we might organize ourselves is for me to talk about the, the really to zoom out for a second, talk about the, the broad problems and challenges it seems to me our justice system faces, then suggest to you the mindset you might usefully have in thinking about the future of courts. And I also want to speak about some research I did some years ago on the future of the professions to give you a sense of how other professions are changing in light of technology. Then I want to look at the short term and under that heading, really focus on COVID and video hearings. Look at the medium term, focusing on what I call asynchronous proceedings, a term to explain. And look at the long term, speaking of artificial intelligence. And finally, and it might seem rather incongruously, but you'll get the point hopefully when the time comes, I'd like to speak of a neurosurgery. So let's start with the problem. Uh, well, in fact, there are three problems. The first problem, of course, and tragic it is, is that many hearing rooms around the world have closed over the last 15 or 16 months. The second problem in consequence, that many large backlogs have built up. But there's a third problem which predates the, the COVID consequences for our court system, and that's the access to justice problem. Uh, because in our world, even in our most advanced legal systems, if you take civil disputes, by and large, in most systems, the resolution costs too much, it takes too long, the process is excessively combative, it's also unintelligible unless you're a lawyer, and I'm going to argue it's out of step in a digital society. It's not that we don't have wonderful judges and wonderful barristers who are well suited for particularly complex matters. What worries me and always has done is how we can resolve low value disputes and do so in a way that's proportionate. But in a sense, we might take comfort from other jurisdictions, the staggering backlogs around the world. And again, these predate COVID. In Brazil, there's 80 million cases in, the, in their system. In India, there's 30 million cases uh, in their court system waiting to be heard. But I think the most challenging statistic of all comes from the OECD, who said a couple of years ago, or noted that only 46% of human beings live under the protection of the law in our world. That's less than half the people in our world have realistic access to lawyers and courts. And my preoccupation now is how we might use technology to sort that out. It is interesting, isn't it, that more people have access to the internet, 59% of people in, in our world, uh, than have access to justice, 46%. Fascinating, too, that every day over the past year, every day, an average of over 600,000 people went online for the first time. So that's a little bit of context. What about mindset? Well, in this time, I think a great challenge to our justice systems, I think we need to look at the way we resolve disputes rather differently. And the question I've been asking since the mid-90s is this, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate together to resolve all our differences? Or might there be, in a digital world, different ways of resolving legal problems? I'm always uh, encouraged, and I tell this story all the time, but it, it gets me thinking every time. It's a story about Black & Decker, who manufacture power tools, who apparently when they recruit new executives, take them off in a course, sit them down in a room, and put up a slide of a gleaming power drill and say to the assembled executives, this is what we sell, isn't it? And they all agree, of course that's what we sell. We're Black & Decker. We're the world's leading manufacturers of power tools. And the trainers, with some satisfaction and a flourish, put up a new slide. And uh, they say, we don't actually sell power tools because that's not what our customers want. This is what our customers want, and they show the slide of a hole neatly drilled in a piece of wood. That's what our customers want, and it's your job to find ever more creative, imaginative, competitive ways of giving our customers what they want. And isn't there a lesson here for all of us, no matter what we do, that quite often when we're thinking of the future, we tend to be a power drill mentality. How do we do what we do a little bit quicker, cheaper, better in the future? Not often enough that we take the step back and ask what's the fundamental value we bring to those we advise 
And might that value be delivered in a different way in a digital society? So in a sense, that's the premise of this presentation. What's the fundamental value? And it's considerable. But what is the fundamental value of values you bring as barristers? And might that be brought in a different way in a digital society? And I want to outline some ways that that might happen. Another mindset issue relates to technology. You should distinguish between automation and innovation, in my terms. Automation is basically computerizing what we already do. So the first 60 years of legal technology and court technology was devoted essentially to grafting technologies onto our existing ways of working to streamline, improve, and optimize them. Innovation is something rather different and, frankly, far more exciting. That's the use of technology to allow us to do things that aren't possible without technology. And, and that is often, in the jargon, rather disruptive because it's technology taking on tasks and roles that historically perhaps have been taken on by human beings. So that's a little bit of mindset. Let's turn to the professions. In 2015, with my economist son, Daniel, we wrote a book called The Future of the Professions, and we're just updating that just now. But what we wanted to do was look across eight different professions and see the way in which technology was impacting them. And it's remarkable what we found, just to give a snapshot, in education, and again, this is pre-COVID, more people in one year signed on to Harvard's online courses than had attended the physical university since its inception. In medicine, to give one example, in Stanford University, they developed a system that can diagnose malignant melanoma, looking at an image of a lesion more accurately than a team of dermatologists. In journalism, even as far back as 2014, Associated Press were using algorithms rather than financial journalists to generate their earnings reports. In tax, over 50 million people in the United States no longer use tax advisors, but instead use online tax systems like TurboTax. I understand very few of these people are bemoaning the loss of personal interaction with a tax advisor. People always find that amusing unless you're a tax advisor. In audits, they're in for a huge change. And uh, the idea here is it's a strange business audit. You assemble once a year and take a sample of transactions. But the idea now is you can actually look at all transactions with the technology to do this and do this on a continual basis. So the continuous 100% audit, an audit system running in background in major companies instead of human auditors is technically possible in my view already today, but for regulatory and cultural issues, the reasons will take some time to come through. Even in one of the quintessential one-to-one -one consultative advisory services like consulting, you've got McKinsey providing online services. Many people say, of course, uh, this kind of technology that you're talk talking about, Richard, can't really have any effect in the more creative industries. Well, I ask you to have a look if you, uh, after this talk at the Hamburg Concert Hall. It delivers everything that Vitruvius would have wanted as to say a safe, beautiful, functional building. And when you see uh, images of it, you think it's really rather remarkable. What's more remarkable still is it wasn't designed by human beings. It was designed by algorithms. Perhaps our favorite system or app that we looked at, though, was in the world of uh, the clergy, also a profession, we found this app called Confession, and uh, highly controversial. Indeed, the Vatican itself got involved in deciding whether or not this was a good thing. Um, it's got tools to allow you to track your own sin, and it's got drop-down men menus offering options for contrition. And the general view, apparently, the Vatican was that this was a useful tool in preparation for confession, but no substitute for the real thing. And in a way, that is a, a summary of what Daniel and I call one of the two futures that we see for the professions. We call this the reassuringly familiar one, and it's one of automation. That's when technology comes along simply, as I said, to systematize and computerize what we already do, not so threatening. But there is another future emerging on the back of artificial intelligence and other increasingly capable systems, and that's one of systems and machines taking on tasks that historically we thought could only be undertaken by human beings. And in our view, for some years yet, uh, we'll see both these futures unfolding, but we find it hard to avoid the conclusion as we move deeper into the 30s, for example, that a lot of the work the professionals do will be done entirely differently and largely by machines. So what about law? Let's, as I say, look at the short term and video hearings. And COVID-19, of course, accelerated the uptake of that technology. Another thing to look at perhaps after this talk is remote courts worldwide. It's a website, www.remotecourts.org. Uh, funded by, and thank you, Ministry of Justice, uh, put in place by Society of Computers and Law and Law Tech UK. What we've been trying to do is track developments in the use of remote court alternatives around the world. And we now have, I think it's 167 jurisdictions that in one way or another have used one form or another, as I say, of remote courts. 
the, the, the three techniques are audio courts, essentially by telephone conference call, paper courts, essentially hearing cases and papers alone, or video hearings, which has really been the dominant, um, the dominant remote court during the COVID period. People have talked about video hearings for many years, and most people have been skeptical, but they were, as it were, thrust upon us over the last 15 months. I want to make five observations about video hearings. Um, first of all, I think it is fair to say they've worked much better than most judges and barristers would have predicted. I think we asked most judges and barristers in February 2020 about the use of video hearings. Most people would have anticipated they would be more or less useless. And I, I, I think we can, we can rewrite history that this was my world and this was the feedback. Secondly, and contrary to the views that I had and many have, judges and lawyers can adapt very quickly. When the platform is burning, when the iceberg is melting, it transpires that judges and lawyers can adapt and have adapted remarkably quickly in embracing this new technology. I think thirdly, it's fair to say that many minds have been opened, open to the notion that we might solve problems rather differently. And I view this as a springboard. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to think more deeply about how we might deliver legal and court services differently. And I think it's also true to say some minds have been changed. Some very considerable opponents have become uh, avid enthusiasts of this technology. It's slightly simplistically said that COVID-19 has accelerated technology. It has accelerated the technologies we use to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate. And this is one great example. And just in passing, one of the interesting things about this technology is what we're using today is the worst it's ever going to be from now on. When we're talking about the future of video conferencing, do remember, this is it. This is the worst. It's only going in one direction. Uh, but COVID's also decelerated technological change. Uh, and it, what I think it's done is actually accelerated automation and decelerated innovation. You've heard far less talk about blockchain and AI and machine learning during this period, understandably. People just try to keep their heads above water. So it's not all been an accelerating effect. The fifth thing, and, and, and pretty important, I think, is that we've seen a polarizing effect uh, due to COVID. And I'm referring to post-COVID life here. Um, People's response when they're thinking of the future of video hearings, at one end of the spectrum, there's the cautious, and the other end, there's now the gung-ho. At one end, there are those who are hankering and hunkering, uh, hankering after the old ways and hunkering down until the viral storm passes. And at the other end, you might even see a new orthodoxy has emerged. There's a number of uh, judges and lawyers and I saying, this is the only way ahead. Uh, I sit somewhere in the middle of all of this, but I thought it might be worth uh, just pausing to discuss the four bars recent statement on the 5th of May 21, the four bars together, and by the four bars, I mean that of England and Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and my native Scotland. I'm a Scots lawyer by background. Uh, together, they produced a statement on administration of justice post pandemic. Uh, and this sits towards, but I'll be entirely fair here, sits towards the, the cautious end. It's not entirely cautious. Uh, but um, they make the point, and this is a quote, careful consideration is needed before any decision is taken to employ remote hearings more widely once COVID-19 is behind us. Completely sensible. So they point to some widely rehearsed shortcomings, difficult to cross-examine, lack of human interaction, impact on the well-being of participants and so forth. And that these are all points well made. They then, I think, go a little far. They say the universal, universal sentiment across the four bars is that remote hearings deliver a markedly inferior experience. And I think that's too sweeping. Uh, when I look at remote courts worldwide, 168 jurisdictions, of course, there are many people who have concerns and many do believe it's a markedly inferior experience. But I do say there are others at the other end of the, other end of the spectrum. I also think that we have to consider for whom it is an inferior experience, because in, in my own research and activities within house lawyers, many of them are welcoming for certain kinds of hearing the greater use of video. Uh, as Aristotle once said, the guests are better judge of the feast than the cook. Now, the conclusion of the four state, the, the four bar statement is the, and this is reassuring, they are uh, genuinely reassuring, they're supportive of the continuing use of technology in our courts. It, it is in no way a Luddite expression. I don't think that. And they then say, and I agree with this too, the remote hearing should become, quote, the default position for short or uncontroversial procedural business. I agree with that too. But then they go on, and I think this is where we can have useful debate. They say for any hearing, quote, any hearing that is potentially dispositive of all or part of a case, the default position should be in-person hearings. And that I think is really the focal point of the discussion we, we must have. Briefly, my response to this is, I think they're right in their position, especially to be cautious. I think what I, I'm really pleased that they've done is opened what I believe 
is a, a vital conversation. It's a huge policy issue. What kinds of issues, what kinds of cases are suitable for what kinds of hearings? And actually, it's not just video or physical. Uh, there'll be asynchronous hearings. In the future, it'll even be virtual reality. Lady Hill was talking about mobile hearings, pop-up courts, as Lord Thomas used to call them. There's a whole bundle of options out there. We need to have a systematic discussion about what kinds of issues and cases should by default be allocated to what kinds of mechanisms. And the reality is that the research that's out there actually argues both in for and against the kinds of positions of people at the end of the spectrums. What we need to do, um, and this point is well made, I think when you speak to the bar, is gather more data. We've not done enough of this. This is like a huge uh, unscheduled experiment. We should gather much more data. And we've got to be more rigorous in our research. Uh, we're also familiar in medicine, aren't we, with uh, uh, peer-reviewed randomized control trials. We have nothing like that, or very little of that, in the publications about uh, video courts. But if our policy making is to be genuinely evidence-based, we actually really need to smarten up our methodology. So I agree in the short or uncontroversial procedural business point. I disagree with their conclusion on hearings that are potentially dispositive, all of them by default being handled physically. Now, I, I believe if we're to solve the access to justice problem, for low value cases, we should not default to physical, nor should we default, in fact, to video. We should default to what I'm going to introduce in a second is asynchronous hearing, more of that in, in a moment. Uh, but taking all of this together, uh, it's quite interesting over this period that people have been sending me messages saying your future has arrived. And I think by implication, it's time for you to step aside. Um, but I actually don't think the future has arrived. I don't think home working is a full transformation of court services. I don't think dropping hearings into Zoom as it is, as many pundits want to say, a shift in paradigm. The reality is the people, the rules, the process and the problems are much the same. And so it's been a fascinating 15 months, it's been a remarkable response. I think we have this response, that is to say, that judges and lawyers have rapidly embraced the technology to keep the system up and running. I think we are, we have a very polarized debate, so I welcome what the bar have said, at least insofar as they are encouraging debate and encouraging the use of video in some cases. So that's the first thing. I think our short term is going to be, to some extent, preoccupied with the extent to which we can industrialize some of what's gone on during COVID. What about asynchronous proceedings? Well, a little bit of history here. I was asked in 2014 by Lord Dyson, then MR, uh, to put together a group to look at online dispute resolution. Been hearing a lot uh, about uh, alternative dispute resolution online, as it were. And uh, Lord Dyson and the Civil Justice Council were interested to hear more. Uh, and I think the idea there, in fact, I know the idea was, are there ways in which we might divert some cases out of the court system by using uh, a kind of uh, emerging form of electronic ADR? Well, in the end, we identified a whole number of technologies. And uh, I've come to revise this view to some extent because of COVID, it's just for practical reasons. But the view we came to is, if there are exciting new and important ways of resolving disputes, surely some of these should be embraced within the court system rather than simply outsourced to the private sector because that seemed to be the, the option. A hybrid model is now emerging. But anyway, we, we recommended what we called and defined online courts. Uh, Michael Briggs, uh, then Lord Justice Briggs, in his two reports on the structure of civil courts in 2015 and 2016, endorsed and built in these. And in transforming our justice system, uh, the joint report by the Lord Chancellor, uh, the Lord Chief Justice and the Senior President of Tribunals, uh, they too carried some of this forward. So a little bit of an explanation of what this is involved, because we're still through the reform program, only part of the way in delivering this. Uh, and the model of online courts, I, I've uh, described it, uh, some might say, inordinate length in, in my book uh, of that title. But let me try and simplify it down to two basic concepts, asynchronous online judging and extended court services. So the idea of asynchronous communication is this. Communication is asynchronous or let me put it this way, it's synchronous when the people communicating need to be available at the same time. So a phone call, a meeting, a video meeting, you all need to be available for the communicating to take place. But we've become very used to a different form of communication, which is called the asynchronous communication, which is often wildly more convenient. The email, the text message, the WhatsApp, you don't both need to be there at the same time to usefully communicate. And so one of the ideas of, the, of, of uh, asynchronous online judging is that no longer is there a hearing, video hearing or physical hearing. 
It's actually what for many years has been called a form of paper hearing. And what we were advocating for are high volumes of low value cases that are often a bottleneck in, in, in justice systems around the world. Couldn't we, at least for some of these cases, allow people to submit their evidence and arguments in electronic form for there to be some kind of online discussion and for the judge to deliver his or her determination in the same way? A binding judicial determination by a human judge, but no physical hearing, an asynchronous process, no taking days off school or work, no question of judges having to work normal hours, uh, attracting, we felt, a far more diverse judicial community, in consequence, more convenient, lower cost, whole bundle of advantages. And I became fairly evangelical about it. And I want to be absolutely clear, there's lots of kind of cases where this is not suitable. But if we're going to crack these low value cases, um, we really need to think very differently. But the second point, and far more radical in a way, was I, I believe, and I've gone on to say more forcefully than we did in this Civil Justice Council paper, that in the 21st century, if the state is going to provide a fully comprehensive court service at a time where, let's be honest, public legal funding is diminishing, it's not enough simply to have a less costly dispute resolution service available. You need to have tools online that help people understand their entitlements, that help people understand the options available to them, that help people organize their evidence, that help people marshal their arguments. We need tools to help people settle the cases on their own. Uh, rather than going to judicial settlement and so forth. And the great news is there's a whole bundle of technologies out there under the heading of online dispute resolution that can help us achieve this. Now, this is not a pipe dream. If you look at the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia, this has been up and running for a number of years. It's a system that has something called a solution explorer. And in a number of areas in which this tribunal has jurisdiction, uh, essentially human beings our users are tracked through a decision tree. They get some sense of the legal issue, uh, and there's opportunities for negotiation and mediation online. And if it eventually does reach a tribunal judge, it's not done by any, uh, generally, invariably not done by a video hearing, by a physical hearing, it's done in the papers alone. And what is striking is the level of satisfaction amongst court users. Now, I accept uh, that legal and court services, what economists call a credence good, that's to say, the recipients of the service often aren't sufficiently expert to judge whether or not what they're getting is high or low quality. I accept that. So similarly, you go to a doctor, you often think a doctor's great because he or she were friendly, but that doesn't mean they were any good technically. Uh, so I accept that it isn't the end of the story that courts, court users are singing the praises of the tribunal, but it's very encouraging that they felt fairly treated and that they felt it was a useful resolution. And when I speak to my friends in large-scale arbitration, they would say, well, already, uh, historically, even before COVID, uh, many major issues, at least interim issues, uh, were settled in the papers alone. I say again, in my view, this is the key to tackling the backlog of low-value cases and the global access to justice problem. Uh, and, and I, amongst others, are championing that around the world, particularly in developing economies. So that's the, the medium term. Uh, like it or not, and many lawyers won't like it, but I think we will, in order to meet the challenges that our courts face, move to more and more asynchronous hearings. Not suitable for all cases, I accept. So what about artificial intelligence? Well, I, I've got about 20, 25 minutes left to try and explain what AI is, and, uh, but let me do my best. Um, let me make, first of all, a preliminary observation about technology. Uh, I think there's two things to know. First of all, our systems are becoming increasingly capable. Forget all the technological jargon. In a sense, this is the big technological takeaway. Our systems are doing more and more. Barely a day passes that we don't hear or read about some new system app breakthrough and all the rest of it. Uh, and the pace of change is accelerating. And the second and related point is there's no finishing line. No one in China or Silicon Valley or South Korea is dusting their heads off and saying, job done, that's technology sorted, let's move on to something else. Quite the reverse, the pace of change is accelerating. And this isn't just about AI. Let me take you into a field that I suspect very few of you are familiar with, uh, the era of effective computing. Effective computing, machines that can both detect and express human emotions a system that can look at your face and tell whether or not you're happy or surprised or angry or disgusted. There's now a system more accurately than any human being can look at a human smile and tell whether or not it's fake or genuine. There's a system more accurately than any human being can listen to two female voices and tell whether or not they belong to a mother and a daughter. Uh, there's even systems now that can express emotions as it were back to you. Uh, I bring to you news from the outside world of the uh, the, the Huggybot. And the Huggybot's a robot that scans your face, determines your emotional state, 
And in terms of duration and intensity, we'll give you just the right kind of hug for the occasion. I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying our world is changing in ways that are almost unimaginable. But let's talk about AI and the law. The field for me began in the early 70s in a paper by two guys called Buchanan and Hedrick in Stanford Law Journal, backed up a few years later by a paper in McCarty, 77 in Harvard Law Journal. I came into the field in 81 as an undergraduate law student in law and wrote a paper called Computers in the Judicial Process. As Finn mentioned, I then wrote my doctorate, my DPhil in Oxford from 83 to 86 uh, on AI and law. So it's been my lifelong interest. So the first comment I say with a little bit of confidence, and it's this, and I hope you find it reassuring. Almost all the short-term predictions being made about the impact of AI and law hugely overstate its impact. So I'm afraid there's so much nonsense talk. Everyone seems to be an expert now. So much speculation. Almost all the short-term predictions, <clears throat> in my view, hugely overstate its impact. However, almost all of the long-term predictions hugely understate its impact. Will the work of the bar and the courts and law firms be transformed by AI over the next couple of years? Of course not. By 2030, in my heart and after 40 years, and I've never been able to say this, I really do think by 2030, we'll see some very considerable changes, which in a sense defines our challenge. The 20s is the decade in which AI affects the legal world. A little bit of time travel, go back to the first wave of AI that I was involved with. Uh, so from 86 to 88, I collaborated with a man called Philip Kapper, who at the time was the chair of the law school in Oxford, and been one of my examiners, expert in construction law. And we developed a system. It's the first, world's first commercially available AI system for lawyers, and it was called the Latent Damage System. It advised in a remarkable piece of legislation called the Latent Damage Act 1986. Here's a quotation from it. Section two of this act shall not apply to an action to which this section applies. Uh, and it's, it's no easier when you read it slowly. Uh, so this was this remarkably cumbersome, convoluted uh, piece of legislation that actually was inserted into another piece of legislation. And Philip was saying, no one really understands this, and yet it vitally affects the data for which actions can no longer be raised. So why don't we use the techniques that you develop for your doctorate and develop a system that can answer that question? It can answer a whole series of quest ask a whole series of questions in the end, say, here's where you're at, when your action's time barred. So that's what we did. We developed the system, and this was in the days where floppy disks genuinely were floppy. Remember, this was pre-web. You couldn't say go on the web. The web didn't exist at this stage. So people had to, we wrote a book on the subject and the two floppy disks that were the system. How did it work? It was like a big decision tree. Two million paths we handcrafted, two million through this system. Complex area of law. And in the end, Philip to this day will say it was better than him. It reduced research time from hours to minutes. It provided a series of explanations uh, for the dates. It identifies the date of actions time barred. It never had a Friday afternoon syndrome, it never had a hangover. It was relentless, it was rigorous, and it outperformed any human being in the country. Uh, that was over 30 years ago. So to some extent, that first wave of AI, which is a big decision tree or flowchart, that is technically feasible. We know that. In fact, Solution Explorer in Canada is based on the same kind of technology. We didn't anticipate three things, of course. The web came along, and uh, I suppose as many people who, who are sitting here or watching, who can remember, was like in the web game. It's unbelievable that from nowhere, being an isolated island of processing, you could suddenly link to other systems, deliver services yourself, receive services, look at information, all immediate. So that it was just phenomenal. So the practicality, the commerciality of it took many of us away from AI because we wanted to deliver content, advice, documents, and so forth on the web. We also didn't anticipate this huge explosive growth and processing power. So amazed by uh, the news in 97, when Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, was beaten by a computer system called Deep Blue. We thought that would never be possible in the 80s, because we didn't think computers could process quickly enough. But just think about this, when that system beat Kasparov, it could explore more than 330 million possible moves in one second. A good chess player can juggle about 100 moves in his or her head at one moment in time. But to be clear, Kasparov wasn't beaten by a system that thought like him. It was beaten by brute force forcing swing power. The third thing we didn't anticipate, and this is really the new world of AI, is the emergence of machine learning, systems that learn. So this is the kind of thing everyone will hear about and go, yeah, yeah, systems that learn. I, what does that mean? So let me, the, the best way I have of explaining this is the way I learned to speak French at school, which was very badly. But what I was given was a list of words, we called it a vocabulary, then the rules of grammar. I was meant to put them together. And the result, as I say, was unimpressive. 
a couple of friends of mine went to Paris for the summer and came back fluent. What was really interesting was that they don't, didn't recall learning any words. Uh, they didn't actually know any rules of grammar, but they had just absorbed huge amounts of data from cafes, from friends, from newspapers, from the, the TV. And that's the difference between first generation and second generation AI. First generation AI, the stuff that Philip and I did, like everyone who was working in medicine and all the rest of it, we had to expressly, expressly program and articulate and represent knowledge in the system. Like the person who absorbs huge amounts of data and somehow has the capacity to speak the language, that's what these systems do. They absorb huge amounts of data and can find in these data correlations, patterns, trends. They can, on the basis of that data, make remarkable predictions. They can predict whether or not a lesion is cancerous. They can predict, take Lex Machina, a system developed by Stanford, bought by LexisNexis. It said it can predict the outcome of patent disputes more accurately than any US patent lawyer. Knows nothing about patent law. It's not working through the full text of patent judgments or anything. It's got information about 200,000 records of past cases, who the judge was, who the law firm was, who the advocate was, the name of the litigant, the nature of the claim, the size of the claim. Turns out if you have enough objective data about past cases, using statistical computational statistics, you can make a more accurate prediction about the outcome of some cases than using the legal method. It's a huge challenge. And many lawyers will say, hang on a second, folks, this is dangerous. Um, doesn't know anything about the law. Somehow lawyers don't think that's a worry in medicine. You don't think it's a worry that 127,000 past lesions and the results of the pathology will allow your potential skin cancer to be more accurately predicted by that system, but we do worry about it in law. And that's the thing we found in looking at the professions, that every profession thinks every other profession could be changed with technology, but not theirs. We all do our special pleading. But hang on a second, so many barristers are thinking, I think, I reason, I'm creative, a machine can't do any of that, so I'm safe. That's to commit what Dan and I call the AI fallacy. And this is my biggest point of all. But that's the mistaken assumption that the only way you get systems to perform at a high level is somehow by getting them to copy the way we work. It's a remarkably anthropocentric way, human-centric way of looking at what we do. Kasparov was not beaten by a system that copied us. The idea that we often have, and certainly is rendered in cartoons, that lawyers will be replaced by a robot is daft. To think that a robot will sit in our chair is as daft as thinking a robot will sit in a self-driving car. Autonomous vehicles don't need drivers. Uh, the same drew to for a lot of the tasks we want to undertake as lawyers. When a chief executive says, what's the chances of, our, of my winning? Power drill hole in the wall, folks. We take out the power drill, which is the legal method. But if you use computational statistics, that probability, which is the hole in the wall, might be delivered more accurately. So we've got to think differently about what it is we do. But can a machine ever be creative? Think about AlphaGo, computer system developed by Google's company, DeepMind, phenomenal company. Um, Go is a board game way more complex than anything uh, you see in a chessboard. More permutations in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And most people thought that a computer system could never play a good game of Go. And then a few years ago, AlphaGo, the system designed by DeepMind, beat Lisa Dahl, the world Go champion, four games to one. I'd like you to think of the second game and the 37th move of this game. The system moves the piece. Commentators think it's a mistake. A, world, a, a Go champion later describes the move as beautiful and said it brought a tear to his eye. No human being had ever thought of that move before. In a human being, we would have called it genius or innovative or creative or all of these kinds of words. It was none of these. It was huge amounts of data, brute force computing, and clever algorithms. And that, folks, is the era we live in. These systems that perform nothing like us, they're nothing like the wetware we've got going inside our skulls. These systems perform at a very high level in the same way as autonomous vehicles will do, is the same way as planes that can fly. Uh, they're... The model that we have to copy how human beings work is misconceived. So we're in the era of increasingly capable non-thinking machines. The first wave of AI and law has brought us these rule-based systems, legal diagnostics systems that can answer questions, um, online legal guidance systems, systems that can automate the production of documents, systems that we're seeing now can even analyze legislation. The second wave of systems is bringing predictions. And these are uh, data-based predictions, based on huge amounts of data, predicting the outcome of disputes. In litigation, predicting in a huge body of documents once the system's been trained, what documents expert lawyers, barristers, would think are most relevant. 
And we will see in due course some legal risk assessment systems working where we'll have systems scanning the data within major organizations and seeing as we scan blood for early markers, we'll see early markers of potential legal problems. What does this mean for AI in the courts? Well, there's three ways AI, in my view, will be used in the courts. The first is online legal guidance. Remember, I'm talking the extended court. Uh, one of the tools we'll use is the kind of diagnostic expert system or AI system that, that I was working on in the 80s. A second is tools to help people perhaps decide to step away. So if there are tools available to help people predict the outcome of cases, then that might encourage people to say, well, if it's pretty clear that in my case, there's only a 3% chance of winning, uh, perhaps I'll step aside. But the most controversial thing I want to say is the idea of predictions as determinations. And this, I'm not really defending this, I'm putting it out there for discussion, but this is how it runs. So let's go back to Lex Machina, the system that can predict the outcome of disputes. And let's go back to Brazil, where they've got a backlog of 80 million cases. With all the will in the world, and I do quite a lot of work with Brazilian judges and lawyers, there is no chance on earth of these 80 million cases being sorted out by human lawyers and human judges. And so what about this as a proposition to two warring parties? You say, in principle, your case is one in which, or for which we've developed a system. The system is based on the past decisions of judges and will predict the chances of one or other of you winning or predict the likely outcome of the case. Would you, you would say to the parties, accept the prediction of this system as a binding determination of the court, every bit as binding as a judge, if, say, the degree of certainty of the system is 95% or higher? Now, I'm not saying this is the way ahead, although I can tell you in Brazil and Singapore they think it is the way ahead, but I'm putting it out there, and I have done for a few years, when people say computers can computers replace judges, it's not in the even nearly foreseeable futures will computer systems be able to deliver decisions with reasons in the way that human beings can. But can we imagine a mechanism that is backed by the state that might deliver something that parties take as binding? Yes, I think so in that model. So let's try and bring some things together now and, and do a little bit of concluding. I, I just wanted to say to you that I've not forgotten about justice. Um, when I taught at Oxford, I was a, for two years a tutor in jurisprudence. That's my background. Uh, I'm more interested in justice uh, than anything else. My, all my work's to do about access to justice. And so when people say to me, I've somehow missed the point and it's an affront to justice, what I always say is it's very interesting that people argue for and against the kinds of technologies I'm talking about on the basis of justice. And they do so because they confuse seven different senses of justice, because I think we need all seven in our court system. We need a system that delivers substantive justice, that's fair decisions, procedural justice, that's fair process, open justice, that's transparency. Distributive justice, that's accessibility for all. Proportionate justice, that means the cost is appropriately balanced with the nature of the dispute. Enforceable justice, backed by the state. Sustainable justice, that is sufficiently resourced. And in my book, when I do the comparative analysis, I argue for low value civil disputes that under each of these headings, the online court is as good as, if not better than the traditional system. But let me draw some conclusions for the bar and barristers. And these are actually, I, I looked again at the second edition of my book, Tomorrow's Lawyers. Uh, I'm just about to start working in third edition, but the, the world moves along so quickly that some of it's embarrassingly out of date. But I drew three conclusions um, about the bar, and I still agree with myself for what that's worth. So the first observation I want to say is that I, I'm in no doubt that for the foreseeable future, very high value, very complex, very socially significant legal issues will continue to be argued before conventional physical courtrooms in the traditional manner. When there's a life-threatening dispute, when there's a bet the ranch dispute, clients, I believe, will continue to secure the talents of the best legal gladiators who go into combat on their behalf. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. At this point, most people seem to sit back and relax. Oh, well, that's me. I'm complex and high value uh, and socially significant. But I'm afraid that there, there's more to be said. Um, it's less clear to me that, that it's going to make sense to instruct barristers or trial lawyers for lower value or less complex disagreements. Uh, it's less clear to me, and it's certainly less clear to the general counsel I work with, whether or not this will continue to be regarded as commercially justifiable when, as I say, the disputes are relatively low value. Because we're seeing not just ADR, but I think far more significantly electronic ADR, video hearings, asynchronous hearings, 
they're likely to reduce the number of cases um, that are that reach final closure in the courts or even in the steps of the court. So the reality is, and this is a challenge, junior civil trial lawyers, junior barristers may need to prepare to engage in many more video hearings and online courts if they want to prosper in the 20s. This is no shock to anyone in the world of tax or audit or architecture or teaching. Every young professional should recognize that the world in 15, 20 years will look nothing like the world today. I should also say though that barristers and advocates, that's a nod to my Scots lawyer background, um, who, whose practice is devoted to writing of opinions on complex areas of law, they'll also be less affected by technological changes, um, far less affected than most areas of legal work. There's no obvious, even AI-based alternative source to where this genuinely bespoke guidance on the horizon. Um, much longer term, as we go into the, the 30s, well, my general line of argument is this, is that um, our machines are becoming increasingly capable. If you believe in that thesis, and it's very hard to look at the technology and not believe in this thesis, because as I say, they're not just steadily improving, the, our underpinning technologies are advancing at an accelerating rate. As they become increasingly capable, they're going to take on more and more human tasks and jobs. Now, the standard answer to this for most people is, ah, but this has happened before. New jobs will sur surely emerge. But when Dan and I did research into this, we see no evidence to support the idea that the new jobs will emerge are ones for which human beings have any kind of comparative advantage over machines. That's to say, new jobs will emerge, but machines will take many of these on too. And this is probably when we move into the 30s. And that's why I say it's hard to avoid the conclusion in the long run that over time, there'll be less and less for traditional professionals to do. I'm not singling out the bar, I'm not singling out lawyers. It's true of all professionals, it's true in the world of work. Read my son Daniel's book, um, A World Without Work. It's very hard if you look at the technology and look at the economics uh, to think otherwise. And for many people watching today, that's of more relevance to your children than for us. But I just want to set out the thinking. So finally, let's talk about neurosurgeons. I was invited in 2017 to give a talk to 2,000 neurosurgeons about the future of the professions in Boston. Scary audience. Uh, what was scarier still said, we want you to be controversial in answering the question, what's the future of neurosurgeons? So my opening line was this. I said, patients don't want neurosurgeons. Gasp in audience. I said, patients want health. And I said to them, I don't know if it's 30 years from now or 50 or 20 years, but I bet you in the future, people will look back and say, it's unbelievable we used to cut bodies open. Because the future of healthcare is non-invasive therapy. The future of healthcare is preventative medicine. It's not better surgery or robotic surgery. And so it, it led me to think they were asking me the wrong question. You ask the question, what's the future of neurosurgeons? In a way, and I don't mean this facetiously, you're assuming neurosurgeons have a future. The better question to ask is, how in the future will we solve the problems to which neurosurgeons are currently our best answer? And this is a fundamentally different way of looking at our world. And that's why when Finn asked me to speak about the future of the VAR, I didn't say it at the time, but it's the wrong question. Because, and I again don't mean this facetiously, but it assumes the bar has a future. You're essentially smuggling the answer you want, not you, Finn, but you're smuggling the answer you want into the question. The question we should be asking is how in the future will we solve the problems to which the bar is our current best answer? And I believe in a digital society, that'll be by using increasingly capable systems as well as outstanding human beings. But I think if your supposition is somehow that the current model will continue unchanged, that is unwarranted. It's not supported by the technological evidence. It's not supported by comparative evidence in other professions, and it's not supported by technological advance. Here's a weird way to end, but people don't actually want barristers in the same way as they don't want neurosurgeons. People want the outcomes that you bring. And as I say, your major challenge in a digital society is to think how you might bring these outcomes in different ways. And for young lawyers for whom this is seem to be rather depressing, I say the reverse. It's given to very few young lawyers to come out of law school and be involved in shaping how it is we deliver legal services, in changing the way we offer access to justice. Young lawyers have this opportunity to help design the systems that replace our old ways of working.
my last slide that I usually use is a, a picture that I want to describe to you. All you can see is a deck chair. What well, looks, I think, like quite an old person sitting in a deck chair with a cocktail in his or her hand and with a, a nice Panama hat on. And I think that might signify two things. For those of you who are perhaps nearing my age, you'll be thinking, I hope I can hold out to retirement before any of this guff en engulfs me. But I look upon this rather differently. I think the person sitting in that chair is one of tomorrow's barristers. Uh, they're sitting, you can't see it, but they've got a laptop on their knee and a cocktail in their hand, and they're just pushing the finishing touches on an online pleading before the online court. There's a very different world ahead of us. It's not necessarily a world that is less attractive. I think it's a world where we can find deep meaning in the work we do by designing the systems that replace our old ways of working and a world in which we can genuinely increase access to justice. Thank you very much. Back to you, Finn. Well, uh, Professor Richard Siskin, thank you very, very much indeed uh, for a, uh, uh, a talk which has challenged us all to think about our future and the future of the law and the court system and barristers. So now is the happy moment where I get to throw uh, your opinions open to the legal gladiators I have assembled, in your phrase, uh, for their views, their responses, their thoughts. And uh, Nick, if I could start with you, uh, um, uh, uh, over to you. So what, what is your reaction or your thoughts or responses to Richard's talk? Well, Richard, thank you. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, you and I have already had a number of discussions about how your, as it were, outcome based analysis of AI and digitization uh, should be treated really as the, the way in which we should be looking at things. And we, as you know, have been quite a lot of that in the Law Commission, looking at how AI is going to affect the structure of law in the future. But, but standing back and looking at it from the perspective that as a judge, and of course I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the judiciary, but looking at it from the perspective of the judge, it seems to me that we're looking at two things. Remote hearings are all about communication methods. And as you say, our, our greatest concern has got to be access to justice, where fundamental rights are being impinged upon by use of remote hearings, and where we draw the line is going to be crucial over the next few years. AI is going to be more about the content of the disputes that we hear, whether face-to-face -face or in remote hearings. And AI is going to impact upon the uh, to take the next few years in a variety of ways. Uh, public law decisions are now taken by AIs. Huge numbers of social security payments by the state to individuals are largely governed by AI-based decision making. HMRC makes assessments which involve AI. Police allocate resources according to software-driven advice. So we have offender risk assessment. We have facial recognition. Private law cases in the future smart contracts will come before the courts where there's a dispute based upon the software which generated the smart contract. And I think my, my question to you is this. You, you identified a number of ways in which you thought AI might impact upon the court. I think that we, the judges, are going to have to grapple uh, with AI-based evidence. In particular expert, we're increasingly asked to receive expert evidence which uh, the conclusions of which are based upon algorithms and calculations. And how are we, the judges, the judicial system, how are we going to cope with determining disputes which are largely driven by possibly two competing al algorithms? How do we do justice in those circumstances? And I've certainly seen more and more expert evidence over the last three or four years, incredibly complicated, which you know that the sense of the strength of the evidence is based upon the assumptions which underlie it. And you find the assumptions somewhere in chapter 11, footnote 476, a very complicated piece of maths. How do we cope? Am I, uh, Finn, going to answer the questions one at a time, or would you like me to gather well, them? Uh, why don't you uh, uh, have a go with next question? Because I'm sure your answer will provoke a thought from someone else. Uh, and um, uh, uh, and you know, Nick, he, he always likes to get the last word, so he'll come back on anything you say. So wh wh why don't you? Why don't we? Why don't we discuss that one? Well, well, thank you, Nick. And and 
you and I have discussed this issue before, but lurking behind this is the difficulty that second generation AI, but not first generation AI, interestingly, are systems that don't provide particularly good explanations of the conclusions they offer. So in all these either safety critical or socially critical situations where machines are, as it were, coming to, I prefer to say conclusions rather than decisions, uh, but where they're coming to conclusions, um, with a typical AI system, it's not possible to say to it, how did you come to that conclusion? When AlphaGo did that move that no other human being had ever done before, it isn't really a meaningful question to say to it, how did you come up with that idea? Because it used to be that in first generation AI and their decision trees, you essentially can offer an indication of the, the route through the decision tree that was taken and you can evaluate each one. Uh, but that's because it was based on a, our articulation of a body of knowledge. But that's not how these systems work. And a, a lot of people just say, oh, we need these systems to stop being black boxes and we need to be uh, far greater explanation. I think to some extent that's not understanding the underpinning technology. It, it's, it's almost not meaningful to ask for an explanation for a system that hasn't come to its conclusions in the same way as we do. It's committing the AI fallacy to say, can you give me an explanation? It's anthropomorphizing. It's thinking that that system can give an explanation uh, that reflects the kind of explanation we're used to if you're speaking, say, to an expert witness. That's point number one. Uh, and I'm not saying it's impossible because the systems that can essentially, or we're working on systems that can essentially simulate what looks like a credible rationalization of these conclusions. And I always say that might be what we do as human beings as well. So we shouldn't be too sniffy about that because we're very often when we, when we as experts come to conclusions, often we have uh, intuited a conclusion and we do some kind of ex post facto rationalization. So what we're going to need is to develop systems that have a level I would call of rationalization and you can, you can take that on its, face, on its face value. But we also need tools. And again, it's, it's early days. We're at the foothills. We've got to work quickly in this. However, tools that can undertake algorithmic audits, tools that can uh, audit the data uh, so that it may well be you can never, as it were, get inside it, but you can at least be confident that the methodology that was used to develop the software, that the processes that were used to gather and refine the data, the, the testing that was undertaken to look at the outcomes and conclusions was sufficiently rigorous. So I, I, it, may, it, it may well be that we are, insofar as we're going to be holding human beings responsible uh, rather than machines, and of course that's a debate, uh, but as far as we're holding machines responsible, I think it will be according to the standard of care they've taken. Um, I, I, we're not at the stage where you can say to that AI system, how on earth did you arrive at that conclusion? I think a lot of people who are listening to this this evening will have at their back of their minds. They will immediately say Horizon, post office scandal, which was, if you like, some fairly unsophisticated algorithms generated a few years ago now, but none of the lawyers, none of the judges, nobody was able to spot the problems. At least until it's too late. And then, of course, the, what happens when they did spot it? But that was a of justice that went badly wrong based upon software. Absolutely. And I'll make one final point because I do want others to have an opportunity. What we're not very good at is aligning human process and machine process. You see this a lot in discussions of autonomous weaponry. When you try to put a human in the loop and you try to get humans evaluating second-guessing machines, uh, we generally have a, a bad track record. I think we'll come... I mean, in medicine, it's interesting, I think in medical diagnostics will come because there's huge amounts of empirical evidence to support, not to question. And I know this sounds dangerous, but uh, it's interesting, the dermatological system, my dad's a retired dermatologist, and he said, like, I saw 300 melanoma in my career, system has got 127,000, it's going to outperform me. We'll look back in 20 years' time, think it's unbelievable, we thought that uh, we needed to get a second opinion from a human being. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe we will. And so let's get a second opinion from a human being uh, and turn to Alex Chalk. Uh, Alex, uh, um, it's so overwhelming, I'm, I know, but tell us what you I'm think. I'm qualified for that, but thank you very much. Um, Finn, well, I, I just, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I thought that was fascinating and, and thought provoking. And I just want to open up a, a different um, front, if you like. So moving away from the AI to the other part you referred to, which you might think of as the kind of the grunt 
plug technology, the stuff that actually makes our life easy. And you suggested that it actually had enormous scope. I want to suggest that actually that scope is perhaps more limited than you indicated um, for the reasons, the very reasons that you gave. So you said, well, look, um, in terms of all this video technology and all this tech, yeah, it's don't worry. You know, when it comes to the high value and complex disagreements, as you described it, don't worry. You know, these, these lawyers are always going to be um, involved. But the difficulty with that argument, I respectfully suggest, is that for the litigants themselves, and I speak as somebody who did uh, crime, but also I've spent a lot of time speaking to the president of the family division in my ministerial capability, capacity rather, is that these disagreements are very high value and very complex, even if they might be perceived to be uh, low order or bulk uh, um, objectively. So for example, the individuals who are seeking a child custody arrangement, individuals who are trying to sort out the terms of their divorce, these are incredibly stressful. And the reason why that's important is the second point you made, which is when the bar described it as a markedly inferior experience, uh, you said, well, Aristotle talked about um, uh, ask the diners, not the cook. The trouble is litigants themselves, if, for example, they're in that family matter, can feel very, very short-changed by a hearing which is all done on Zoom. And there is an importance, I would respectfully suggest, uh, of experiencing the majesty of the law, if that's not too pompous an expression. People need to understand that there is somebody who is absolutely considering this, who isn't distracted by the cat uh, looking out the window, and um, their lives to turn on this. So I would challenge you to find a disagreement which truly falls into the category of being low value or not complex to the litigants. And I suggest that vanishingly small. The second point I'd make briefly is that, you know, I, I am a, I'm a member of parliament and I deal with a lot of people um, who write to me with their various issues. I had a student from a university on uh, Remain Nameless, and she said to me, can you sort out writing to my university, please, Mr. Chalk? Because they basically have got a situation where they don't want me back at university. They just want me to be paying all these fees, in effect, for a license agreement to what back catalogues of last year's lecturers. Now, it might be that that last year's lecturer was AJP Taylor and gave the most fantastic lecture on something, but it doesn't cut, cut the mustard. Those individuals want to be there and they want to see that individual. And I suggest that there's a crossover for law as well. You can't all do it uh, down the, the Zoom. Where I respectfully think you're, you're right is there is a whole load of grunt technology that we can use more effectively. You talked about asynchronous hearing. That's why we're doing in rape cases section 28 where people get their evidence in the can. They pre-record it so that she, usually a she, doesn't have to have the trauma of court, et cetera. She knows it's done. I've given my evidence. Off I go. Um, equally, uh, um, I'm trying to push something called ELSA, Early Legal Support and Advice, where we use the tech that's available to get people better access to justice. So we've got a set of things up called Finding Legal Options for Women Survivors. So you're a woman. You see, you're there in the bathroom because your abuser is out there saying, if I get you, I'm going to kick seven shades of the proverbial. You go on to find legal options for women survivors. You write what is happening to you then and there. The tech then converts that into a witness statement. I kid you not. The message then goes out to a legal aid lawyer. Can you pick up this case? The legal aid lawyer gets it. It's, a lot of it's been pre-populated. The section 23 application, whatever it is, is to all intents and purposes done. Following day, you're in court seeking your non-molestation order and so on. So that's where the tech can make a difference. And that's why we back law tech, as you kindly indicated. So uh, I thought it was absolutely fascinating and thought provoking. I do think there are uh, limits. And um, so it's one of those ones I partly disagree and partly agree, but I thought it was fascinating and I've gone on too long. Well, the, the funny thing about what you say, um, in, in a sense, if we disagree, it's an empirical disagreement. That's to say, uh, it's not a conceptual one. It's about what it is court users actually think. Um, and this varies not only from place to place, but from time to time. Now, I, I, of course, I understand uh, the point that's often made is that uh, a low value case doesn't mean that it's not of great legal significance. It's what we, it's, it's what in, in my, in, in the world of my courts, we'll talk about the Donahue Stevenson case because everyone wants, everyone will say, well, uh, in the Donahue Stevenson case, your online court wouldn't have identified that. I, I get the point that there's no mapping between complexity and value. I also take very seriously the point for any individual their own particular claim is one of the biggest th deals in their lives. Where we're apart, and it doesn't really matter whether or not you or I are apart, that I, I go back, to, I go back to, to the users, is the extent to which users would prefer to assemble physically or would prefer a simpler process. 
Um, and even if I concede, which I don't, that, that what you've said about the current state of willingness of users is right, I want to think a little further ahead because I don't believe the next generation thinks similarly. I don't believe the next generation will think about the majesty of the court. Uh, I don't, because people often say, hang on a second, this online court is a some kind of economy class service. The real courts, the first class service. I don't think that at all. I think if the economy, I think if the online court is cheaper, quicker, more convenient, means you don't need to take a day off work, means you don't have to uh, instruct expensive lawyers, the next generation of court users will regard that as first class. So uh, I think we have a disagreement, but it's one, and it goes back to my point, we don't actually have the data because you can refer, as I can, to, uh, to experiences and research that suggests X, Y, and Z, but for every bit of research that says, People want to go to a physical courtroom. There's lots of research that suggests uh, that's over-egging the pudding. And honestly, I just encourage you to look at the, the levels of user satisfaction in the Civil Resolution Tribunal. The other point, I make to Alex, I mean, in a sense, I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to help the government here because I don't think there's an alternative narrative. This is why I say I, I go and speak at legal aid conferences and everyone's really getting irritated with me. I, I go speak at all these events and people are, uh, and lawyers are great at this. They all say, here's the 43 things that are wrong with what we say. There isn't an alternative narrative about offering increased access to justice that involves simply scaling up what we do just now. A, it's not affordable. B, it's disproportionate. It's disproportionate no matter who's paying. I'm not saying put more public funds in. If it's disproportionate, no one should be paying for it. So it's not that. Uh, so I, what I've been trying to do, and yeah, I, I work closely uh, with, with your colleagues and with all governments and with the judges on this, I'm genuinely trying to think of a way that we can make the court system more accessible. And honestly, for minor money claims, for minor personal injury claims, for minor landlord and tenant uh, uh, agreements, I do think there are lots of people who prefer a quick, cheap, asynchronous process than attending the court. And I must comment on majesty, because it is a word that's used, and you did correct yourself a little bit. I don't think it's about majesty. I think it's about solemnity and authority. I think a majesty yeah. is completely... Uh, but it, but, and I'm not surprising you, Alec, but it's symptomatic of people confusing how we do things with the outcomes uh, we want. And I, I really do. Of course, I want something that's solemn and authoritative. But I think this idea of majesty in of itself being intrinsic importance, I, I personally don't buy it. Well, no, no. Well, I, th I think that may be semantics. I'd say it is, but what I, I meant, to Majesty, is uh, for, for, for solemnity. The, the only point I'll make just briefly in response is I think the future is now, if you know what I mean. I think we're seeing people who are very, very much into tech giving their feedback. And there was a very um, quick uh, bit of market data that was done, um, surveyed by the President of the Family Division, by the Nuffield Trust, about litigants in family disputes. And whilst you are respectfully absolutely right when you talk about the, you know, the, the pre-trial hearings and all that kind of governance, of course that can be done by Zoom. But the litigants themselves, in response to this during COVID survey, they were asked, "What do you make of this?" And a lot of them were saying they felt shortchanged by it. Now these are the very people who have grown up; they are digital natives. So all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that I'm quite prepared to accept that um, there are loads of. Uh, interlocutory hearings where you simply don't need to bother tipping up and maybe you can have your cocktail and all that kind of stuff. But I do think in the agony of that moment, you do need the solemnity. And if you can bring that by tech, fine, but I don't think we've brought, I don't think we've cracked how to bring solemnity by tech to those critical hearings. I, I, I agree with much you say. I think it is also relevant that that research was done quite early on in COVID. It's also yeah. relevant that a lot of the levels of dissatisfaction, this is important, I'm not minimizing it, are because of technology failures. And it's not a criticism of government systems uh, unless you've got the bandwidth, unless you've got the tools, unless you've got the privacy. Uh, the, the reality is if the technology is right, and the environment's right, and people feel sufficiently confident, they can have a great experience online. Uh, and, so, and so we go back and forth. I, I say to you again, we have to have the medical mindset. We have to have the equivalent of the randomized control trials. So we move away from people that like you and me expressing our our views on the basis of bits. Of, I'm not emphasizing you as much, me as much as you. We're, we're cherry picking the bits of research that support our instincts. We've got to do more than that uh, in evidence based policy making. Thank you. I'm going to move us on to, this, uh, to, to Krista. So we're going to move away from the family division, Krista, to someone who spends our life telling major corporations uh, how to deal with their legal problems. So what, what are your thoughts in response? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, can I first of all, Richard, um, 
the say as everyone else has. I thought that was uh, really fascinating. And I love the description of lawyers as being solution explorers. I haven't heard that before, but I'll definitely be using it going forward. I guess I had two reflections um, on what you said, and, and they're these. Um, I'll make them quick because there's, there is more than one of them. So the first is I'm interested in the role that you would reserve for real human beings in all of this. And the importance of the relationships which lawyers build up with their clients, and I mean barristers with solicitors and solicitors with clients and barristers with clients. And it seems to me that at the moment, certainly, there are three reasons why those are really important. Um, the first is that we deal with crunchy problems where we often have to persuade clients to accept advice that's unpalatable, uh, that may be unwelcome and is difficult. And in that context, actually being a trusted advisor is something that is really valued, as I say, whether it's a solicitor um, or a barrister. I say that also because we, we all of us give the best advice when we really understand our clients uh, and know about their business and understand what motivates and drives them. Uh, and the relationship, the human relationship is really important with that. And I suppose, thirdly, that in what is, after all, a highly competitive market, human relationships um, really do count. When I talk about the right legal advice for the client, it seems to me that in our notional decision tree, uh, there's a lot more than um, putting in the sort of legal building blocks at the beginning and spitting out an analysis of the Latent Damage Act or whatever it happens to be at the end. Because for any client who's facing a complicated problem, actually picking that apart and working out what to do is about so much more than just the law. It's about the fact factors that impact on their reputation, it's about their stakeholder expectations, it's about a whole range of factors to which the law is, is generally not the answer, the law is just one facet of the answer. So I'm interested um, in, uh, frankly, how long we've got in terms of lawyers giving some human input, uh, both in terms of the relationships and in terms of the non-legal bits. The other point, if I may just very quickly, is that it seems to me that what you were talking about presents us with real challenges in terms of training the lawyers of tomorrow. So most of us on this call have done a legal training, uh, probably all of us, done a legal training of uh, what you might call an old fashioned apprenticeship nature, which is seems to me to be the equivalent of your trip to Paris rather than reading the vocab list. It's an incredibly immersive um, experience in which you can't fail to learn. And if you say, well, it's fine because for better. Bet the farm stuff in the future, there will always be a role for the experienced advocate and for, for the barristers uh, with whom we all like to work. That, they'll, they'll be fine, but they've got to learn somehow. So I'm interested in your reflections on whether or not the professions, both solicitors and barristers, are doing enough to train our junior lawyers at the moment to be the partners and QCs in the 30s and 40s, um, and how we need to react and reflect the sorts of changes that you're talking about in terms of that training. Thank you. And I'm conscious of all these questions, and they're, and they're, and they're, they're, they're great questions that um, it would take a lot, it would take an, an event to answer them all. But um, let me take the second one first about training. A uh, question I keep on asking is what, what are we training our young lawyers to become? And I, I feel we're training them to become, particularly in law schools, uh, um, I can say this is a law professor, but I, I think we're, we're, we're training them to become 20th century lawyers rather than 21st century lawyers. So how we teach and what we teach in law schools has to change fairly radically. I also take the point that uh, so much learning is still in law is fundamentally on the apprenticeship model. And it's a weird thing, but you just sit in a room with a person and you absorb a lot. And, uh, and I really do think COVID, a lot of that's been lost. Um, but what's also interesting is my automation point that uh, some people think, well, the answer, of course, is just to is to drop lectures into Zoom. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, this is, again, just an example of automation. I don't think uh, I think we have to do much more than that. I always think of the people who um, astronauts uh, when they're when they're just about to make their first actual flight and they're sitting in the cabin. They don't look around and say, "Oh gosh, first time I've seen one of these." Uh, of course they don't. They have for years been in simulators, and these simulators, which let's be honest, folks, are way more complicated than legal work. Uh, these simulators have given them for years an environment. Now, I think if you look at the say the work of Paul Maharick and his work in uh, uh, in transforming legal education. What we will need to do is is build uh, simulated practice environments, uh, virtual reality. It'll just be wildly different. But the idea for most people, they say, "Oh, that's e-learning." You just you listen to a lecture online, and people say, "Well, that's no good because you you don't experience the sitting next to a person." But actually, through VR, we will be able to give 
a far wider set of these apprenticeship experiences. And I go back again to say, this is what we're doing today is the worst it's ever going to be. VR will be three-dimensional, holographic. Uh, it, it'll be the, the sound coming from everywhere. So we have to, if we're thinking of training and learning, we're going to lift our game there, there as well. Go back to your first question. Um, we're not far apart in this. And in fact, Dan and I, uh, when we identify the roles of professionals in the future, one of them is what we call the empathizer. Um, because we, for example, let me take you into medicine. We believe in the future, uh, when you go and see uh, as much of primary care, uh, what's more likely will be, whether it's virtually or uh, in person, the, the, the human being you see is an empathetic practitioner nurse, and the diagnostics is done by a system. Now, the system is like the latent damage system in the way you described it. It can do some of the nuts and bolts. It can come to the conclusion. But how that is conveyed, uh, how the reassurance is offered, what context that is given, I think that's still, for many, many years yet, the human task. Uh, and so the, the role of empathy is very important. And many lawyers do a lot of agreeing at that point. But, you know, the reality, let me talk about surgeons. <laughs> Most surgeons are just not empathetic. Most lawyers, they, they're not at that end of the spectrum. So we can all agree, but most clients wouldn't say the great thing about my firm is how empathetic they are. In fact, they say inability of lawyers in law firms to sit in the shoes of the general counsel, to see what the risk looks like from my desk, to understand the demands from my chairman, to know what the non-execs are thinking, to understand the risk appetite of the company, all of that. And so I think you're absolutely right. Uh, that uh, there are, by implication, there's a whole bundle of tasks that only human beings can do. But the funny old thing is, and this is what we're training our human beings to become. That's why I took that point first. We're not training them to become the empathetic client handler, relationship builders that is the wrapping you need around the more mechanistic service. And also for many years yet, the strategy, the tactics and so forth. But in litigation, project management, document analysis, legal research, prediction, there's lots of stuff that will be done differently. So I don't think we should be too binary about it. It's not either or, it's how human being, my idea has always been, you disaggregate, you decompose legal work into tasks. And there are some tasks that human beings are better than, than the machines are. And there's some that actually will be competing. Yes, which, well, that, that has opened up the uh, appealing prospect of every Linklater's trainee of the future being Krista's trainee because they can have a virtual Krista and therefore we'll have you know fleets of empathetic strategists uh, which every client is looking for. So we've, we've, we've moved forward in that way. Uh, Sue, uh, certainly not least, but uh, we always get to our own last. We put our guests in front of us and so we, we turn to Brick Court last. Uh, and um, we've heard an awful lot about a lot of different things. Do you have well, any I mean, the, together? the problem about coming last is all the good questions have been asked and 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 all the points made. But I mean, just listening to you as a as sort of a member of the bar, I'm going to say it's not only fascinating, but I agree with in an enormous amount of what you've said, and that actually the key to the transformation to this sort of properly integrated online justice system is a sort of iterative process which requires everybody to cooperate, the designers of the system, the lawyers, the court users, et cetera. And like you, I don't see an imminent threat to the bar by the increased use of technology, which is you know, more capable systems and more machines taking on tasks that were once the, the province of lawyers. But clearly, it seems to me that the board needs to really actively embrace and lead on this charge and, and guide the processes, not least because the algorithms we use are as, only as effective as the data that you put in. And as you say, the more data that's captured about court use and court users, the more reliable the insights we get from them. Uh, albeit I think there is a vexed question and there's the who holds all this data and, and who will have access to write the, the court algorithms. Um, and, you know, if we are going to rely on this technology as barristers, you know, we need to better understand it, I think, and also anticipate the implications of it. You know, for fear, as I think Lord Sales said, you know, the, the frog in hot water effect. Um, you know, how do we example for it, guard against human prejudices um, that will necessarily feed into, you know, algorithmic coding. You know, uh, AI mimics necessarily, uh, you know, human doesn't it mimics human thinking, but it does it very different way. So, you know, it may well lead to very unexpected results. And and importantly, it seems to me is who's going to be responsible for errors made in the use of these algorithms. 
but but critically, and I'm, I'm coming to my question, and it's really picking up on where Alex uh, made his point, and it's not about the sort of majesty of, of the court, but my question is this, and it's one that Gillian Tett very recently touched on in the FT, you know, so she's the Financial Times US editor at large. She said, made the point the other week about focusing on data and AI, and is there a risk of losing sight of the sort of bigger context and picture outside an algorithmic model? Because we're not robots, and we're contradictory, and we're complex, and we're multifaceted, and we all recognize that faith in the justice system is absolutely critical. So I suppose the question I have is, you know, do you really think that court users have the appetite for having their disputes resolved by an algorithm or where an algorithm plays an increasingly significant part in the resolution of the dispute? I mean, we saw the A-level scandal of last year, which showed you know, how algorithms programmed with the wrong criteria can cause you know, havoc and distress and distrust. And do you think like similar concerns about the system, about the prejudices being programmed in with the algorithms will affect the integrity of the and standing of the courts? I mean, I suppose put differently, you know, as a society, will we value machine learning justice as much as having your day in court and being heard by the judge? And and just finishing this point, if I may, just the thing that comes to mind is, you know, the IBM machine learning called Project Debater, which they did in, in, you know, running Cambridge, which, you know, can debate against a human. And it was able to write the answers and rebuttal. And I think it has, you know, five billion sentences in the database that it can use. But I think the overall sense, and I, not surprising, I suppose, is that the computer doesn't engage with the feelings of the humans as much as the human debate debater. So I just wonder whether a justice system where a person doesn't feel that he's had his case or she's had her case ultimately being resolved by a human judge may not be a justice system which is valued as highly, um, or will we just get on with it and in, you know, in, in times to come past in 20 years' time, we'll just be used to it? Sorry, a rather long-winded question. It, it, it's all great stuff. And I, 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 what I want to say is what, what I'm trying to do today is start a conversation rather than finish a conversation. I hope I'm not seeming too dogmatic in this issue. This is one so pleased that Rick invited me along to speak. And I'm so pleased that Alex is here because actually we have ministers just now who are genuinely and senior judges who are genuinely committed to this. So the reality is now is the time to start thinking and discussing these issues. Uh, and some of them, again, I say are empirical. There, there it will be through research we can find out what the views of other people are. Um, Many years ago, when I was doing my research, there was a guy called Marvin Minsky, who was one of the very early AI scientists, and he said the next generation of machines will be so clever, we'll be lucky if they keep us around as household pets. And I used to think that was quite funny, but I don't think it's so funny now. I really do think, not over the next few years, but I think into the 30s and 40s, humanity is going to have to come to terms with sharing the planet with not systems that perform at our level, but if you read Nick Bostrom's book, for example, on superintelligence, systems that are wildly more capable than us in so many areas of endeavor. And I think there'll be, I think this will cause us to review not our principles, but the outcomes we want in life. And so, and here's again's research is so interesting in, on why people have disputes. And the reality is uh, people, some want their day in court, some want an apology, some just want to get on and so forth. And so the reality is some people, for some people, the online mechanism uh, will actually just be cheap and cheerful, quick and pragmatic and work that Alex will know about that uh, MOG have been funding that we've been doing looking at SMEs. 99% of businesses in this country, 99.9, are SMEs. 60% of the turnover of corporate Britain comes from SMEs. They are suffering badly from, from the simple question of recovering debts. And the court system isn't, isn't for small businesses that want to get on quickly, isn't lean enough. And so MOG funded this project that, uh, that we commissioned to study on what kind of online dispute resolution platform might work. Now, of course, there will be some, no doubt, who want to say, I don't want a system. I want a, I want a flesh and blood judge decided my case, but I'm sure, and again, this is speculation, uh, but I'm sure there'll be many people who say, you mean within a week, 
we can get our problem solved and we can keep our relationship going. And so it'll be horses for courses. This is something we also need to feed into our policy thinking. We can't say this is a definitive way. We, we in a sense, it'll be up perhaps to some parties, except that one of the ideas here is we have to redress the imbalances where one party has so much greater resources. So that is um, uh, the question. You asked the question, appetite. I think some will, some won't. How will we feel? Others will feel great. I want to get out of it. Others will uh, feel short change. Young people will think, this old-fashioned stuff, it's not for me. This, it was amazing. I went online and have it sorted in minutes. Older people will think, what's happened to justice? Uh, I like the, the wood paneling courtrooms. I like the wigs and judges. So we're, we're not going to speak with, with one voice in this. Um, you are right, of course, that this isn't about, just about data and AI. But just to say something about machine learning and data, machine learning is, the, is our best current way of doing AI. I'm not convinced that in 20 years' time, we'll, AI will still be machine learning. When I did AI, it was logic programming. When AI has been done to now, it's machine learning. Uh, I know that that's the way it's done today, but uh, quite hard for computer scientists to accept this as well. Our lives will be changed by 2030, probably by technologies that haven't yet been invented. That's the speed, that's the speed of change uh, to bear in mind. Um, just a comment about the, just, just a couple of com competitive comments. Uh, I always say to, to lawyers or to any business person, the competition that kills you won't look like you. Uh, so we tend to think that when we're thinking of our competitors or oh, another set or so forth, but look at this burgeoning law tech startup community. We'd assembled here five years ago, there were about 100 or 200, there are three or 4,000, each trying to do a, to a corner of law, what Amazon did to book selling. Now everyone will think, well, it's not gonna affect the work I do, but that's a failure of our imagination not to see most of these three or 4,000 will die. Two or three of them will completely change the game in ways we can't yet anticipate, in my view. Uh, who is responsible, you ask, for the errors made? That's something that uh, Nick and the Law Commission uh, have been given serious attention to. Um, but the final comment, in a, in a way of pulling all together, but two final comments, if I may, Finn. One is that it, it's become less fun having these events because people agree a bit more. So uh, the, uh, maybe it is time for me to step aside. But it used to be when I piped up, everyone was horrified. Uh, and so I, I do genuinely uh, thank you, everyone, for, um, for, uh, for, for the support as well as the challenge. But the second thing is, how should the bar look upon this? And it really is a half full, half empty thing here. I think many people look at this as a threat, but I, I don't think you should look at it in this way. Uh, the reality is no one is suggesting the market for legal services is diminishing. Uh, we live in an ever more complicated world. The, the, the need for sound legal advice, for sound legal representation uh, is increasing. The only question is who's going to satisfy that market need in what ways? And in the bar, you have some of the cleverest, uh, most imaginative thinkers. And so I think rather than thinking, what's the minimum we can do to compete with these emerging systems? You need to look at it differently to say, how can we actually lead the way? And by we, and I'm sorry to say this for people who are, or beyond the UK, one of my preoccupations is how it is that in the UK, we can continue to be a leading centre for dispute resolution, how we can continue English law uh, under underpinning international trade. And I think to do that, our legal system has to be a leader in embracing legal technology. Thank you very much. Finn. Thank you. Uh, um, I had a feeling that Nick wanted to come in and say something, but I'm also am aware that we've, we've hit pretty much seven o'clock. So I think... Um, I think it is probably time for me to say an enormous thank you to Professor Richard uh, Siskind for a fascinating, engaging and interesting talk. Uh, and a big thank you, big, not enormous, but big thank you to our four panellists for taking time to sit, listen, reflect and give their perspectives and their uh, uh, observations and generate a bit of discussion and a bit of conversation around it. So uh, thank you all very much indeed for your time. I uh, thank you all of those watching, listening for your time as well. I'm going to finish with a little reminder that you don't want to forget your potential opportunity to make a donation to Brick Court Centenary Charities. Uh, there they are. Thank you. Uh, uh, you can go to that link and uh, uh, give some money towards uh, the Sutton Trust, Inter University, uh, 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 Advocate and the Access to Justice Foundation, if you wish. Uh, um, so thank you all very much indeed. Uh, and finally, I would like I mean, this is the moment where we should be clapping and thanking Richard. So we will all virtually clap. and Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Thank you all.